Well, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Ramon Mara Toledo. I'm a professor of computer science at James Madison University in Virginia. Uh, my topic is very similar to what Professor Aragon has uh, presented before, because it's also on data science. Um, in my job here at the you know, Adolfo Ibanez University is going to be is, going to, is to help them to set up a discrete mathematic programs that never been taught here at, on this campus in Viña before and help them set up a data science program. There's a reason for a, a, which one is the right? right. So I'll be working in the area of discrete mathematics. Discrete mathematics varies what mathematicians understand for. Um, my background is in physics and mathematics, and then I came here to the United States to do a PhD in mathematics in topology. But a friend of mine, the day before I came, he said, Ramon, there's no money in mathematics going to computer science. <laughs> that's the future. And he was right. Uh, so. Um, so I switched to computer science, also the, uh, and I also the, got to do an MBA. And then I went on to finish the PhD in computer science at Kansas State University. Um, a lot of people ask me, why do you went to Kansas? Because, you know, Kansas is flat. It's, it's, it, but I had immigration on my tail, and, I, and <laughs> um, that was the first university to accept me, and then I went. Turned out to be, I had a very wonderful experience, the best place that I can think of. Um, when immigration, after I finished it, was my tales again, they were the people who came to rescue me, and uh, well, I was able to stay in the United States because of them. So my, but the mathematics per se, we already know what it is. This great mathematics, it's a popery of topic that we used to cover before in the 70s and 80s that now we brought them together under the computer science umbrella because we found that they are helpful to computer science. It helped them to think, to look at analysis of algorithms, speed, and things like that. But data science is what I'm interested in because uh, the university that I'll be working on is basically a business school. And the, even in the latest conferences in the United States, the big CEOs of the companies, Facebook and Google, are advocating that we teach uh, data science. And there's a lot of universities now offering degrees in data science that I don't know if they are really data science. Some of them just think that data science just crunching numbers, but there's also not only the visualization, uh, the people also have to understand that I may be a computer scientist and I'm sometimes working with physicians looking at x-rays that I don't know anything about. So I need to work with a domain, somebody who is a domain expert who can help me understand what I'm doing, what I'm looking, and what, how also educate myself in that. Just because I'm data science doesn't mean that I'm going to produce any report that you want, because I may not know what you want. Okay? So there's a gap that somehow we need to bridge. And in this opportunity, uh, what I'm going to try to offer this student is a hands-on approach to understanding the methodology of data science. As we'll see, there's an aspect of data science that is cleaning the data. The data that we receive is not clean. The people that are probably using the tools that I can assume will not be doing that. They need another expertise. They need to be some time a computer scientist that know languages like Perl, Python, that will, and also be an expert in databases, so they can bring the data to a point that we can use it, transform it, and then present it. 
because most of the executive, as well as I'll show you later, are not aware of the potential that they have, that the data is an asset, and, the, and there's a case a few years ago, very famous, after a, after a hurricane in Florida, where somebody in Walmart, the, the operations in Walmart, took the data, uh, they saw what people were buying at Walmart at the time, so the next time uh, another hurricane was coming, she already have collected all the data and made sure that the Walmart have the thing in there. Obviously water, beer, and <laughs> some type of bar, candy bar that people bought. They didn't know that people were buying that, so they made sure that they, that they have this particular fruit bar. And when the hurricane came in, the sales went up. We can also see that at the university where I work. After the summer, you can go to Walmart, but as soon as the students are coming back, the first thing that you see is the beer, case of beers. That's, they are there, the Doritos are there. So they know what the students want to buy. And so that's what I'm trying to do. Obviously, there's a lot of statistics, classification techniques, Planetary modeling that we need to do and, and data warehousing, but it's uh, things like that. Okay. In particular, I'm going to be using uh, a tool. It's a programming language called R. Uh, R is a full programming language, but it can also be taught in such a way that people who don't have ex much experience in programming can learn it fast and can be somehow productive assuming that the data is clean. Okay. So I need to make that clear to the student that these are tools that assume that your data is clean. How are we going to do that? Well, that's a different course that hopefully I can. I have worked also, now the, the, the fellow from the embassy is not here, but in, in one of the areas that I'm working now with some of my students is something that is very popular now in the state is the fake news. How do we differentiate between real news and fake news? Okay. Um, it has been an interesting. Also, we had worked some work in, in data translation, particularly in Spanish, because that's my native language. And, but it's funny, as you mentioned, that there are some misunderstandings. Uh, there's a famous case where this student gave to the translator from Russian to in English, said the spirit is willing, but the, the flesh is weak. The translation comes, the fresh, the meat is bad, but the vodka is good. So <laughs> <laughs> not necessarily uh, you know, understood the spirit as alcoholic beverage. So, so I'll, be, I'll be working with R primarily. This is um, a program that is free uh, to download. Uh, and it works in basically any computer. It's a successor of a previous language called S. And because the author, uh, Ross Hike and Robert Gentleman, they, their name both begin with R, they chose it as a, as a well, why not? I mean, it's, it's, it's called R. Now, um, so we'll be using this as a main tool because uh, the student can learn it without knowing too much about computer science. They are not computer science. Most of them only have an introduction to, to, a, to a programming language at the beginning of their career and may not be able to do that. Okay. So let me give you, uh, nowadays we call this big data. And why it evolved? Well, everything began basically after Internet Web.2. Before we used to see uh, static web pages, now we can interact with them, we can uh, scrap them, we can get information from the web pages. We know everything, and we can find out every click that you make, what you see, what you don't see. Okay? So we also, so what is called big data? I mean, that's one of the names that. What is it called big data? Well, because now we are inundated with it. Okay? It's not as the processing of maize 
massive data set that they are also real time and they also help you make decision making. If you are in the stock market, you don't know what happened. You don't, not in, you don't care what happened a week ago. You need to know what's happening now. So I, do I sell or, or not? Or do I buy or something else? So what happened is that the big data is too big, moved too fast, and doesn't conform to what you used to use in, in traditional databases. Now we have tweets, as you mentioned, we have videos, we have uh, photos, we have all sort of stream, uh, voice, everything. So the problem with data that we have is very big, fragmented, is very diversity, there's duplication. I mean, you, you can see that a, that a tweet gets repeated many times. Uh, sometimes it's fake news. Sometimes it's just whatever you can write. So how do we make sense and how do we organize that? Okay. So there's volume, too fast, velocity, variety. But there are also some that how long do I need to give the data around to make it still available to useful to my company? Now. What do we call this, this data? Notice, we are talking about z zettabyte nowadays. Uh, a zettabyte, it's a, it's a 10, it's one followed by 21 zeros, okay? If I have that kind of money, I wouldn't be here today, okay? <laughs> so, um, but notice how big this, how big this is, this is, okay? Um, uh, if, we, if we look at, and the calculation of the grain, the grain of sand in all in all the world, in every bit. So we are about 370, 373 times much more receiving data, sometimes even daily, than there are grain of sand in every beach in the world. So how can other? How can we visualize that? Notice that if I if I take an aircraft carrier of the Nimitz type. <coughs> If a gram is equivalent <laughs> to a grain of sand, I can have up to 424 carriers on top of each other, and we are getting the data daily. Okay. So this is not something that we are getting in five years and two years. We are getting that daily. Okay. Uh, so Facebook in 2012 processed 2.5 million uh, pieces of data each day. Okay, so now in this year, in Cyber Monday, in 18, it's all a million items an hour. Okay, so you can figure it out how, how much it's uh, if you sell 24 million of items, how many people went in. You go and do the basket analysis that way every time you go to Facebook, you go to Amazon, they say people who bought. What you're looking at also about this, they are doing the basket analysis. They want to know what you want, what you like, what make you tick, because I want to sell that to you. Okay. Um, now, uh, we have data. We use it for a lot of things, data recognition, uh, disease outbreak, as uh, Professor Ragon mentioned. And we also can track this in, in how many <laughs> times. For instance, when you go to Vegas, as soon as you enter Vegas, there's a camera analyzing your face to see if you are one of the guys who can be in this bar from coming into the, the casino. I mean, there are things that you cannot change. The, the, you can guide yourself, but the, the distance between your eyes, your nose, the uh, distance between the top dip of your nose and your top of your forehead, there are things that you cannot change. Okay. So where data, where all this data come, come, it comes from everywhere, okay? It's not only relational data as we used to do. Now we have phones, we have tweets, we have uh, Facebook, we have all sort of communications available to us, okay? So the question here is there's the data that is coming that is not ready to be processed. Uh, there's also fake data. How do we know that? Some of them 
is not reliable because there may be atmospheric conditions that I, that I cannot control, particularly in New York City, uh, where, the, the, where the data is bouncing from too many buildings that what we get is not true. Yeah, and the validity refer, if I am in, in a company, how long should I keep my data around to make decisions based on what I know in the past? It's also the value and the volatility of, of the data, okay? <coughs> Sometimes things change from one day to the next. Now, uh, and data never sleep, because now we got Netflix, we got uh, all sort of information, and they want to know what you're doing, okay? Uh, so, uh, noticing here we have Netflix makes recommendation on on the movies that you watch, it offers you that. There's uh, the credit card fraud that is used. Are you a possible uh, client that will defraud? We are also using for uh, forecasts and croppings, and obviously the online targeting. We want to offer you something that you may be interested in. Uh, we can see that in the new material development, also pay as you go. Uh, they predict that probably in 10 to 15 years, cash will make this appear altogether. The question is how we're going to protect that and what kind of things, who will be the able to, people to get that. Now, in the Harvard Review uh, a few years ago said that the data scientist is the sexiest job of the 21st century. I, sex is not in the same, they use sort of glamorous, but well, they chose that word. Uh, uh, not necessarily sexy is in the sense we generally think about it, but it's useful. The question is that a lot of the CEOs want us to do that at the, at the university level. We are trying to struggle. How do we go about it? Okay, because a data scientist is just not a number cruncher. Uh, you need some computer skills. You also need mathematics. You need some expertise that you don't have and we cannot provide you. You also need to know about the machine learning and, the, and how to do research. Because just because I'm a computer scientist doesn't mean that I know to do research. So the people that we need to, to educate, how do, we do, how do we teach them all that in just four years with the amount of time that we have? And as they say, the future is not what it used to be. A student are not what were 20 years ago where we can force them to work like crazy. Now we cannot do that. But somehow we need to manage because they need to move. Now, what it's interesting in here is that it, when they did a survey on top executive and how they knew or how could they could use data analytics, how can they mine their own data? Well, notice that most of the, most of them, the highest percentage is people that they don't know how to use it. They don't have any idea what they can ask. And well, if you don't know what to ask, then you, you don't know what, how to use it either. Okay. So that's what we are trying to do here is helping them to set up a program that hopefully uh, will help these students to become uh, entrepreneurs. Most of the students, they tell me, already are thinking of either inheriting business or going and creating their own business. So they have, if they know these, that that can happen, well, they could use that data to this advantage. So, so here we got analytic, uh, data analytic could be descriptive, there's diagnostic, that they're predictive, and there's also the prescriptive. I could look at my data and say, well, let me see what the competition is doing, what, what can we do about it? Okay. Well, that's all what I have to say. Hopefully, it would be a successful trip, and the student will learn something. Um, and thank you for your presentation, because it also ties to mine and shows that the interest is growing and that we may see the field from a different point of view, but at the end, that's what we want to accomplish. Yeah, so very interesting presentation. I, I really enjoy hearing it. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm the founding co-director of the new data science master's program at the University of Washington. And the, the one thing that 
I mean, I, I thought your presentation was excellent, but the one thing that I, that you didn't mention was anything about ethics or algorithmic bias, privacy concerns, ethical concerns. That, that should be also part of, yeah. of this, yes. uh, because most of the time what you get is aggregated data. But if you know how to r ask the right questions, you might find even data pertaining to a particular individual. Yes, there are some ethical issues, things like that. I'm not an expert on, on ethics because when I was in college my, and I took the ethics course, my roommate was also too late in doing my homework. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think just showing that algorithmic bias exists. Oh, sometimes yes. Sometimes people assume, oh, it's done by the computer, therefore it's unbiased. No, and no. It's really important to and, show. And, and you know, if you see, yeah. if you read yeah. it in the internet, it's true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you read it in CNN, it's true. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. And like the fa the famous conditions, like with facial recognition, where it turned out they misrepresent African Americans, for yes. example. They're, oh, they're criminals, right? I mean. Well, and I I, I yeah. did by the way I did the the one in Facebook. Yes. Um, my name Toledo, uh, she came from Spain, but. It could have been Jew, it could have been Arab, because they have to change their last name during the Inquisition. And I turned out to be, I did the one in Facebook, turned out to be that I'm almost 75% African. <laughs> um, <coughs> so I, I said, well, my mother is dead, my father is dead. Well, they don't know anything about it, but yeah, I'm African. That, that's so. <laughs> Just, just one comment on yes. what you just said, which is really interesting, is that currently now in Chile there's a huge concern and discussion, specifically on, on what you said, on unethical and untrust. So um, something happens, a situation, which everybody takes for granted that is true, and after some period of time, you realize that either it was not true <coughs> or it, it was misleading. So now there's a new concept that has been created here in Chile, which is called the post verdad the after truth, basically uh -huh. saying that originally we thought this was true, but we have realized after either a judicial process or basically through through uh, 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 journalists actually discovering the truth, we find that there's a different truth. Well, that's what we're trying to do. One of the things that we want to, to do is try to differentiate fake data. There are some criteria that there's also a particular type of words that are repeated in fake data uh, more than others. So if you do a statistical analysis, the, there are words, uh, I don't want to mention that in here, it's a, it's, it's a political thing, but there's a lot of words that are being mentioned in the fake news more than others. And uh, we are concentrating in those type of information. And then you also have as you said, the, the post for that is going to come later, so you can compare these two aspects. But the information comes so fast and in so many different directions that it's very difficult to distinguish which one is the real one, which one is a fake. Is it a fake video? We did. The, there are people also, imitators, that can imitate pretty good the, the, the in, in particular in Venezuela, for instance, the, the voice of the president, and you may hear him saying things that he never said. Sometimes he said it, and, and so you, it's very difficult to distinguish that. Yes, so I can, uh, I'm sorry, I, I can see lunch is going to be very interesting. We're going to have some very good conversations, uh, but we do have to move on. I'm yes, sorry, I, I understand that. Thank you. Thank you.